you say at the let's say Olympic level in the final? Is is the difference between those crews largely physical, or is everyone about the same level? For example, Michael Johnson said, obviously the dominant sprinter, he felt that the difference between him and the other guys, physical, who really knows who's better or worse, but he felt the real key to his success was the strategic and the mental. Is that the same in rowing? Uh, for us, you know, I, strategic, I guess, in rowing happens long before you get to the regatta, okay. in the sense that it is really in the selection of the crew and the, the grooming of the athletes as you get there, which leads into the, the psychological element of preparation and positive uh, sort of self-image okay. as you go into race. I, in Athens, I, I think we were, uh, and maybe, maybe I'm biased, I mean, I, I think we were superior in almost all the dimensions. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, certainly technically, we were superior. I think tactically we were as good as anyone. Uh, physiologically, we were as good as anyone. You know, and then and strategy is really the realm of the coach. He he had this eye to choose those eight athletes. You know, and that's um, if you had asked me in June of 2004, who would you put in the eight? I, I wouldn't have picked those eight guys. And it, it just turned out to be a combination that was natural and automatic, almost magic. You know, we got in the boat and everything we did was fast. The chemistry was just right. The chemistry was great. And, and what I attribute that to is the fact that within that crew, all nine athletes had the same goal. Okay, we, we knew, like, we won't win, you know. And there was uh, no question about anything. There was really no impediment. Uh, it was simply, we are here to win. We will do what it takes. If one guy said, hey, I want to do this, I think this is really important, all the other guys would say, okay, yeah, we'll do that. We, we, so we it's agree. an honest environment where people can openly take each other's suggestions. Absolutely. And it was, it was a singular, singular focus. Now I want to talk about your career in rowing mm -hmm. and your journey from a young man yeah. to Olympic champion. Sure. And it was a great journey, by the way. <laughs> And it all starts in 1984, when your dad takes you to Lake Casadas. You see the Americans get silver. Saw the American eight get silver. Uh, and that, I, I, at that point, I was too young to know what that really meant. I didn't realize that they were favorites, that they wanted to win. You know, I thought, wow, an Olympic silver medal is pretty cool. You know, yeah. I'd been coxing for about six months. Uh, but what I did see was uh, Brad Lewis and Paul Enquist win well. the gold medal in the double. Okay. Uh, Brad later uh, went on to write Assault at Lake Casadas. double is a two-man yeah, right? yeah. Yes, a double. Uh, and to see them win a gold medal was very, very inspiring. And just seeing the joy of their families and, you know, take the medal off and put it around your mom's neck and take a picture of then your sister and right down the line, uh, that it, it sort of put the hook in me. And, and that, was really, uh, that was really what got me started toward rowing as the dream to win an Olympic gold medal. So would you say that in 2004, you win the Olympics and you have that moment where your family's overjoyed for you, you get the medal of your neck and you're satiated, is that right? Absolutely. I mean, that was, uh, you know, I to give you a sort of an example, yeah. people always say, like, you know, you seem to be at the peak of your career. Why did you give it up? Yeah. And the, the truth of the matter was that uh, in 1984 or even a little bit before that I guess my dream was really to win one Olympic gold medal you know yeah. the, the, no, no desire beyond that because there are so many other things in life that, that you can do and that was, that was it so when we did it I, I couldn't imagine anything in rowing being any more perfect than that so then you have this dream to win an Olympic gold but in 1996 the games made in and you don't make it as a coach. Yeah. What was that? Well, I guess you have to keep things in perspective. I was up against an incumbent coxswain who had won three medals at the World Championships in the, in the years leading up to Atlanta, and you know, including 1994 gold medal world record. Uh, he was very talented, uh, and you know, he had an edge on me. I mean, he, he was in there. You know, he knew the system, and. 
as a coxswain, uh, it's a bit sort of, I, I guess, the analog in American sports is the quarterback. In football, it's American football, yeah. And where knowing the system is a significant, uh, it's a significant import. And, and he knew it. He, he, he could execute the system cold. I, I came in late, and I'll tell you, I gave it everything I had. Um, I made some mistakes and sort of even, you know, drove it into overtime. Uh, the the coxswain was during, supposed to be... During the preparation? Well, no, drove the, the, the selection process for the oh, coxswain okay. uh, into overtime uh, to the point where, you know, they thought they would have the coxswain selected by whatever it was at the beginning of June. And Mike Spracklin, who was the, the chief coach, said... Well, no, actually, we have to continue this on and, you know, explore this more. And in a way, you know, that, that was a certain moral victory because no one expected me to even have a chance. Yeah. Uh, but I, I did my very best. I lost. Uh, but, again, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a stumble on the way to a goal. What did you learn from that experience? Did you get to pick out a few lessons, perhaps, that yeah. you took to get the seat in Sydney? Um, huh. Well, I, I think you learn that... The these, system, obviously. Well, but it, then the new coach came in and it was a completely different system. So, oh. <laughs> obviously, I, I, I had the opportunity to learn the system. Yeah. What you learn is that these people who you think are absolute superheroes, uh, the, you know, the athletes who are in the boat, that when you get there, you go, wow, I've arrived at camp, and here I am among all these world champions. Yeah. They're mere mortals. They're just people. And they, they may be very physiologically talented. They may be very technically talented. They may just be extraordinarily driven, but they're still just people. And what that means is that you too can sort of build those skills and be just like them. So you, there, there's this whole concept that, wow, they're, they're so untouchable to me. Uh, what you learn is they're not. They get injured. They get down. Uh, they have bad days. It's funny because often in sports, uh, perhaps particularly in America, I don't know this, um, the best athletes are put on a pedestal where they almost seem, uh, you can't even relate to them in any way, shape, or form. Right, they look like invincible. Yeah, like Michael Jordan, like, you know, winning his six championships was inevitable. Um, would you say then that perhaps in all sports, people overestimate talent, and often it's the hard work and preparation that goes in that's underestimated? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, to to suggest in any way that you know MJ, that his sixth championship was inevitable, or that, that Kobe Bryant does it on talent alone or anything like that, no. Those guys want it more. I mean, they, they focus their preparation. They are taken very, very seriously. And at the very end, yeah, maybe they do have an edge on talent, but what is uh, the differentiator is that they exploit that gap in talent. They make the most of what they have. And I think that's that's how you put yourself in position to win.